Hi, everybody. Very happy to be here with you today. And I feel very lucky because I was actually with the Mills team two weeks ago in Amsterdam at Fashion for Good, which I'll mention during my talk. Last week, we were in London, and I was able to present at an event they did there, and this week, we're in Hong Kong. So I said to Karine at lunchtime, where are we going next week? <laughs> no, but uh, kudos to the whole Mills team and to uh, Hong Kong Polytechnic University and the rest of the partners. It's wonderful that you've created this space for dialogue at this intersection of fashion and technology and sustainability and innovation, and it's much needed. So I'm very happy to be speaking with you today. So I come from Caring, which is a global luxury group. Um, we have a number of houses under the group, such as Gucci, uh, Saint Laurent, Alexander McQueen, Bottega Veneta, Balenciaga, as well as jewelry and watch brands, such as Pomolato, Dodo Keelan, Ulysse Naudin, et cetera. So I'm going to be talking with you today about our um, sustainable strategy and sustainable innovation. In particular, how are we supporting innovation in design? And how are we looking at how to actually redesign the whole apparel supply chain. So, where are we today? It can get depressing. I'm not going to go into all of the, you know, problems about apparel and textile because we know that and we hear all the time how we're the second most polluting industry in the world, even though nobody knows where that statistic comes from. But there are obviously a lot of issues right now. We have seen um, the UN publish a report within the last year that we only have 12 years left before irreversible climate damage unless we change the way that we're doing things. And Edwin from HK Rita last week in London uh, pointed out that that's only over 2,000 working days left, which is kind of scary. Or you might have seen that the IPBES put out a report last month that a million species, animal species, are going to be extinct over the next few decades unless we change what we're doing. So it can make you feel a bit pessimistic. But then you see all the innovations that people are working on, and then you say, hey, it's not so bad. I'm feeling OK. We're going to make it through. So I, I want to get a little poll. Who's feeling pessimistic overall? Thinks, let's go colonize Mars. We've, we've passed the point of no return. Any pessimistic people out there? Optimistic? Oh, everybody's everybody, schizophrenic. I'm personally schizophrenic. A lot of schizophrenic, okay, one day I think we're gonna make it, another day I'm like, no, okay. So, but another thing I think is interesting with this image is the paradox of talking about sustainable innovation. Because traditionally, sustainability has been associated with, with what? What are some words that people have been associating with being more sustainable? I'm asking you to participate here, yeah. Tree hugger, yeah, tree hugger. So you're gonna look like you're wearing a potato sack if you're sustainable, right? What else? Greenpeace, yeah, and it's been a space for NGOs, maybe, more than brands. Sorry? Repurposing, mm-hmm. So maybe not taking from the, the design, uh, the original design, but taking something in and reusing, repurposing it. Yeah? Not pragmatic, so it's difficult. This is gonna be hard, it's hard to be more sustainable. What else? Costs more. It's expensive. So this is where the quality won't be good. It's going to be. It's going to constrain what we usually do. So there's been a lot of negative con connotation traditionally with sustainability. On the other side, you have innovation. And what do people associate innovation with? Excitement. Excitement. Opportunity. Potentially new revenue, new products. So this whole idea of sustainable innovation can be a paradox, but I, I actually really love it because I think what happens is you can lead with innovation, which is kind of the cool, trendy thing at the moment. You come in and you get a lot of people around the table to talk about innovation because they think, oh, this is a great opportunity. And on the back end, you say, guess what? This is also sustainable and it's going to help reduce your impacts and it's going to hopefully help uh, the people in your supply chain, et cetera. So, I want to tell you a little bit about Caring Sustainability Strategy. It's called Crafting Tomorrow's Luxury, and it looks out to 2025. It's based on three pillars, care, collaborate, and create. So, the, the care pillar is looking at the environment and our impact on the planet, climate change, natural resources. 
collaborate is the social pillar. So how are we working with the people in our supply chains and the people within our own business? And then create. So looking at innovations and new business models, which is really what we're focusing on for today's discussion. So has anyone seen this diagram before? Beautiful bubbles. Yeah, I know a few of you have. This comes from our environmental profit and loss. So in 2015, Caring uh, launched a consolidated group environmental profit and loss which look at, we look, looks at our impacts across the entire supply chain. From, so from tier zero, stores, warehouses, and offices, all the way upstream to tier four, raw material production, along six primary indicators. So I don't know if you can read all this, but it says air emissions, GHGs, land use, waste, water consumption, water pollution. And it's able to help us see where our greatest impacts lie. So what we've found from this EPNL, as we call it, is that most of our impacts, over 90%, are not really in our control, they lie within the supply chain and with our suppliers. And actually over 60% are at this tier four raw material stage. So very far from, from our actual production. Um, so this is, this is actually an innovation in and of itself to come up with this natural capital protocol. One other thing that the EPNL does is it transfers these impacts into a monetary amount. So if basically it's like if you had to write a check to mother nature, for um, all of the impacts that your business has on the planet, what would that be? And so that's what our EPNL amount is. And uh, for our 2025 strategy, our biggest target is to reduce our EPNL impact overall by 40%. And we know, we're, we're confident that we can get 20% of the way there with solutions that currently exist in the programs that we're currently running. But the other 20%, we don't yet know. And that's where innovation comes in. And that's why innovation is so important, because it's going to help get us the rest of the way there. Uh, a tech innovation related to our EPNL is that on June 5th, on World Environmental Day, we actually released an interactive digital version of the EPNL. So people can go on and they can play with the results and really um, understand better how we're coming up with these impacts. And there's enough information that's been open sourced. We try to open source as much of our sustainability strategy uh, information as possible that other brands could actually try to adopt and, and create their own EPNL. So, how are we working um, sustainable innovation into design? I'll, I'm going to give you a few examples here. The first one is our Materials Innovation Lab. I don't know if any of you have heard of this, but it was founded in 2015. It's located in Milan, Italy. And the purpose of the Materials Innovation Lab is to help support our houses in creating new sustainable materials or transforming um, their current collection and production to new sustainable materials. So they have a library of over 3,000 fabrics that they use that the brands can look to. And they also really serve as this connection point between the brands and our suppliers. So that when a brand wants to do something new or when we see new innovations on the market or new startups and we want to test them, we're able to do that matchmaking and understand which supplier would be able to work with which brand to get it into which product and really put that puzzle together. Because it is a puzzle. It's, these aren't, aren't easy solutions in many cases. So they just have a new, created a new office in Milan and, and it's going to ha have a whole sort of showroom to it as well. So it's, it's a very important part of uh, internally within caring for innovation. Another thing that we've done um, to help uh, um, work with students around innovation and sustainability is we've launched an EPNL app, app. So it's called My EPNL. And the first time we tested this was actually with Parsons School of Design in 2017. So what you can do with this app is you can sort of take a look and say, OK, if I want to make a jacket, and I, what's, what's going to be the environmental impact difference if I choose to use cashmere versus wool, if I choose to make it in um, country X versus country Y. So design students and others can test before they actually produce to see what the out actual outcome of the impact will be. So this has been a tool that we've used a lot in different workshops and students to sensitize people to the, de the decisions that th the design decisions impact will have um, on the environment. Another um, thing that we have launched with the London College of Fashion is a MOOC on um, sustainable fashion. So this has already run twice. It's now running again. I think the sign up is happening right around now. Um, so this is another way that uh, design students and others can learn about what are the issues in sustainable fashion and when I'm designing a product, what do I have to be aware of and look out for. 
So if you haven't already taken this or heard of it, I encourage you to take a look at it. Uh, it's about 15 hours of class work. And that was launched with the London College of Fashion. We've had a partnership with the London College of Fashion, a Master's in, of Sustainability, and we also have a uh, Caring Award uh, with the London College of Fashion. So we really understand that working with students and design students is critical in, in creating this change that we want to see in the way we're producing. This year was also the first year that we sponsored the Biodesign Challenge. I don't know if any of you have heard of this. Yes, see a couple of nods. So this is a way to work with university students on getting them to understand how they can take inspiration from nature in what they're designing. So they actually just had their summit last week in New York. And uh, one of the winners, uh, for example, is doing a faux fur made out of milkweed that is bound together by linen, so a completely biodegradable way of looking at faux fur. Another one is trying to provide kits to, 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 uh, to children so that they can develop toys out of mycelium and other nature-based products, so mycelium being a mushroom, mushrooms. So this is another angle we're taking because we're seeing a lot of biotech solutions in the market. So how, how do you start introducing these ideas through university and, universities and help um, foster design with materials that are natural? Retro innovation. So this term comes from my brilliant colleague, Helen Crowley, who's a biologist and a conservationist, who says, we need to also think of retro innovation. Innovation doesn't always, and a couple of the other speakers referred to this. Francesca talked about how we should be working with artisans and even incorporating tech into what artisans have been doing. And Barack talked about taking materials that already exist. But we also have to look to our wonderful natural fibers that exist in the world, our cashmere, our silk. You know, we're seeing the impacts of climate change already with cashmere um, as it gets hotter in uh, the environments where the cashmere herders are. The goats are not producing the undercoat, which is the finest part of the, the cashmere. So for a luxury brand, we have to make sure that we're getting that supply for years to come. So how do we work with these um, herders, which we do. We have a program that, that helps um, support herders in making sure that they're conserving the land and not over, um, over grazing and degrading the soil. With silk, we see that silk, uh, and China being the biggest producer of silk, is very sensitive to pollution and so the silkworms. And so you're also not getting the best quality of silk anymore. So how can we work with organic silk producers, um, also uh, obviously pesticides, how can we work with the organic silk producers and help ensure that we're getting the highest quality of silk? And uh, so I'd like to encourage all the students here to also think about how can you innovate around our beautiful cashmere silk wool. You know, Patagonia innovated around wool. They made a, a fleece out of wool. Or I just saw um, a faux fur made out of organic cotton. How can you drive more performance in our natural fibers? I think it's really important because you're, uh, how many of you know, think you're wearing polyester today? Or know you're wearing polyester? I encourage you to look tonight because over 70% of the market right now is synthetic materials and we have to return back to these natural fibers as well. Um, another way that we're looking at more at redesigning the apparel supply chain in, in general is by supporting startups. So this is a canal house in Amsterdam. Uh, this is the Fashion for Good initiative. Has anyone heard of Fashion for Good? Yeah, some hands. And the mill has a partnership with Fashion for Good as well, sort of an open door to support the startups that are part of this program. So Fashion for Good was founded in March of 2017 by C&A and C&A Foundation. And the purpose of Fashion for Good is to establish an innovation platform where we can support startups that will help us to fashion endlessly. So it's based on William McDonough's uh, Cradle to Cradle initiative theory uh, based on five goods. So good water, good energy, good labor, I always forget. Whenever there's a list of things, I always forget a couple. But um, this idea that we have to look at every stage of the supply chain and the value chain and try to be best in class and support the startups that are working on this. So with um, Plug and Play, which is a Silicon Valley-based investor and accelerator, um, we have a program that lasts for three months. It's actually uh, an, an accelerator in and of itself to support early stage startups 
that are looking to uh, improve the apparel supply chain. So they could be doing new materials, they could be doing different dyes, they could be looking at the production process, they could be doing predictive analytics, so you're producing less, or 3D knitting, or even the chemical or mechanical recycling, or some of these new business models. So really complete along the value chain. And so um, what we do, there's a, a group of corporate partners, so it's an open innovation platform. Caring was the founding partner after CNA. Now we have 13 partners, so it also includes uh, Stella McCartney, um, Target, Bestseller, uh, Adidas, PVH, and um, I'm doing the same thing, Zalando, Auto Group, <laughs> lists are tough. Um, and so with the, this group of corporate partners, we're able to go through a selection process, select the, the best startups that we see, about 10 uh, come in per accelerator batch, they stay for three months, we mentor them, we work with them, we try to launch POX and pilots, and then um, we have another uh, accelerator batch that comes in six months later, so two a year. Uh, there's also a, a, a scale-up accelerator, which runs for about 18 months for, for startups that are a little more advanced. And so this is a great way to support the ecosystem and thinking about redesigning the entire supply chain and, and apparel um, uh, supply chain. And one pilot that we launched is a multi-brand pilot with PVH, c and um, Caring, and uh, Zalando, and it's a blockchain pilot where we've been able to trace organic cotton from the field all the way to the final product, and we've analyzed different tracers, so uh, synthetic DNA and um, invisible fluorescence. We use some RFID, QR codes, to try to see how these tracers perform throughout the supply chain. So we're going to have more information on, on the results of that, but that's an exciting way to use technology to achieve traceability. Another thing that we've done, we launched in December of 2018, is called the K-Generation Award. So this award is, uh, was founded by Caring and Plug and Play. So this was an extension of our um, um, partnership in Amsterdam. And what we're trying to do is support Chinese startups who are looking at these same innovation issues within the apparel supply chain. So you can see here our focus areas are on alternative raw materials, greening your supply chain, retail in use, and circularity. So the awards are still open. You can still apply until August 31st. And we have uh, experts who are helping us go through and do the selection process. We have an advisory council. I was actually just in Shanghai earlier this week meeting with the advisory council and had about 13 startups pitched to us. Uh, we have a jury as well. We're lucky to have Barack Kakmak on our jury who you just listened to there. Um, this is where you can find more information and apply, so I encourage you um, to let others know if you know people who could be interested in this award. Uh, as, again, the application process is open until August 31st, and then we're gonna do the selection and we're gonna have an award ceremony on October 11th uh, during Shanghai Fashion Week. So this is a way to help support Chinese uh, entrepreneurs and also understand the ecosystem and get to know the, the stakeholders who are engaged in this space here as well. So a couple things. Okay, who sees, I want to go over some principles of that, that we've gotten here. Who sees the young woman? A lot of you. Who sees the old woman? Not as much. Who sees both? Okay, I'm going to help the people who can't see the old woman, because, all right, well, both. So here's the young woman. Here's her eye, here's her nose, her chin, her necklace, and her neck and her dress. Okay, the old woman, here's her eye. She has a, a pretty big nose. This is her mouth, and here's her chin. You guys got it? Yeah? Okay, so why am I showing this? <laughs> I'm showing it because... Um, because it's fun and people always like it. <laughs> but also because um, when you're looking at these innovations, you have to be careful of what is the impact. You might think that this is really positive what you're doing and, and so you're charging ahead, but there might be hidden impacts that, that you didn't plan or unintended consequences. So it's really important to think through what it is that you're doing and to think through what's going to happen when this scales. Um, so I would encourage you to do that. For example, using different feedstocks. If you're using a feedstock for your innovation, like corn, which is competing with agricultural land that could be used for food, what's going to happen when this scales? You know, so you really need to, to look at the whole picture. That's definitely something that we've learned. And there isn't a lot of impact data out there for a lot of these innovations, so you have to do a lot of the heavy lifting and work here. 
Another thing which, which is probably obvious but really, really true is you have to have some of these principles in mind, you know, being open-minded, of course, with innovation, um, collaborative. As I showed with the EPNL, a lot of these, uh, a lot of our impacts lie outside of our control. They're with our supply chain, and so we have to collaborate with our supply chain partners. We can't change things on our own. Nobody can. So we have to collaborate with other brands, like we do in Fashion for Good, with experts. Um, it's really important, even with other sectors. What are they doing in food? What are they doing in cosmetics? What can we learn? So that's really, really important. Another thing is that there are a number of challenges. This is still a relatively young space, this whole sustainable fashion um, innovation space. You know, five years ago, there were very few startups actually doing this. So there is still a, a number of hurdles to go through before you can get where you need to with, with a lot of these startups. So first is market readiness. A lot of the startups out there, it's still early stage, right? The solutions aren't really ready to go to be at scale and just like be used. Maybe you can do a capsule or something small, but that, that's where we are now. And hopefully in five years, I, this, this, this will be, you know, not on the slide anymore. Um, quality. Um, I also think a lot of the innovations that are out there, oh, I'm out of time, okay. This is my last slide. But a lot of the innovations that are out there are combining biotech or, you know, chemistry and everything. So helping them understand the, the fashion world and the apparel world and what's needed in terms of standards and quality is very important, and that's a role that brands can play. Impact, I already mentioned. So being sure that you're achieving the impact that you want with these innovations and scale up. Uh, a lot of the ideas are really good, but you really wonder how is this ever going to be industrialized or commercialized. So as you're designing your solutions, try to think also, how would I scale this up? Can this really be something that could be used at an industrial scale? Get people on your teams who can help you with that because it's really key. So I will leave you with this quote, optimistic quote, that the glass is not just half full or half empty, it's actually refillable. So with the 2,000 days we have left, <laughs> let's all work really hard to keep filling up that glass and make sure that we're making the best impact possible for the planet. Thank you.